Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, a world champion fencer, a stand-up comic, a peacemaker, and an organizer in an all-female mosque. Stand by for four Muslim women breaking stereotypes and changing minds. Thank you everybody who sent in suggestions for who we should have on the show. We were overwhelmed. I hope you like our four picks. I lobbied for Malika Bilal, but she, <laughs> she's here already, so, so it doesn't matter. Thank yeah, you. I'm happy to be here. You're going to do double duty. So, a little bit. Heavy lifting here, but it should be fun. So as Femi mentioned, it, there were lots of suggestions from you all. And I'm going to give you a taste of what people were saying. Uh, Malala Yousafzai was one person of several people asked for. Of course, that's the Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Pakistan. There was also an activist from Somalia named Zahra. She lives in Mogadishu. Her handle's on the screen. You can check her out there. And this next person fit as many as she could into 140 characters, Jordan's queen, Ronnie. Linda Sarsour of New York City, Maysoon Zayed, a comic out of the U.S. Those are just a few, but we'll talk to four in particular on today's show, and we want your help. You can send us your questions and your comments for them with hashtag AJStream. I'm Khadija Patel. I'm managing editor of South Africa Votes 2014, and I'm in the stream. On a daily basis, countless stereotypes about Muslim women are circulated on and offline. For instance, Richard Dawkins, the famous evolutionary biologist and prominent atheist, recently tweeted, Islam needs a feminist revolution. It will be hard. What can we do to help? Now, angered by Dawkins' comment, many Muslim women responded, filling up his timeline with tweets like, Richard Dawkins needs to abandon his patronizing white savior paternalist Islamophobia and when was the last time Dawkins spoke to a Muslim feminist? Perhaps there's a, a larger problem here. How much does the world really know about the diversity in the lives and views of Muslim women? So today we're joined by Muslim women who, through their work, are changing hearts and minds. Alia Murabit is the founder of The Voice of Libyan Women. Zakdia Marouf is the first Indonesian Muslim female stand-up comic. Adina Lekovic is the director of the community outreach at Women's Mosque of America. And Ibtahaj Mohammed is a US fencer, world champion, and the first American Muslim woman to compete for her country on an international stage. So, ladies, a fantastic four. Welcome. It's great to have you here in the mix. Uh, let, let's nix this one on the head now. I'm just really curious about what you have to say about this. Sakdia, how does it feel to be described as a Muslim dot, dot, dot? <laughs> your, your job yeah. or your project yeah. always prefaced by Muslim. How, how, how's, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, I, I hope that uh, one day people can go beyond my veil. Ah. But, it, but it's nice. It's nice. It, uh, it, it helps me set the bar, I guess. It does. Yeah, I mean... Um... You know, being Muslim is a part of who I am. Uh, like um, Sekdia said, you know, you would hope that people can see past your veil um, because there's more to you than just your hijab. But again, you know, I totally embrace being Muslim. It's not something that I deny at all. I, I love being Muslim and it's a part of Absolutely. who I am. I think there are people online that definitely agree with both of what you said, Ibtihash and Sukhdiya, but um, this next person describes what it is like to be described as a Muslim dot, dot, dot. This is Wala on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And Ala, I'll direct this to you. So Wala says, it can be quite exhausting to fight for your rights on one hand and be told you have no rights on the other hand. And she goes on to say, especially when Muslim women are constantly painted as inferior and submissive by both Islamophobes, that's the one hand, and radical Muslims, this person says, on the other hand. So, Ala, what's your take on that? Well, I definitely agree. I mean, when my TED Talk was released last week, talking about the role of Muslim women in our faith, the responses were so varied. On one hand, I was told that I don't have a right to speak because I am a Muslim woman. I've put myself in this position. Um, and on the other hand, by Muslim men, I was told I don't have a right to speak because I'm a Muslim woman and inherently have no rights. So there was, it was basically the exact same re reaction, but on two different extremes. I think that if they got together for, for a dinner, they would get along great. 
See, I can see Idina Adi yeah. making yeah. not only mental notes, but she's actually making notes. Idina, what, what are you mm -hmm. writing down? <laughs> what's what's going on down there? Thanks for noticing. Yeah. All right. What, com what comes to mind for me is how often, because I, I have a media background and I've been studying this and working in me, you know media portrayals, and this this Dawkins thing is like so classic, but it, it's that we are constantly defined against the stereotype. If you're normal, if you're just well-adjusted and successful as a Muslim woman, you're, oh, you defy the stereotype. That's the best yeah. that you get. And that's what is, um, I think it's the next uh, barrier or the next milestone that we need to make it past because we need to just be taken for who we are rather than being constantly defined yeah. against the stereotype. That sets the norm and we're the exception mm -hmm. and that needs to reverse. Uh -huh. so, so, I hear you agreeing now with Dina because uh, yeah, because um, as I said before, um, it, it is very important to uh, for for people to finally uh, see us beyond our veil that there is more to us. Uh, while Muslim is is a part of uh, our identity, but there is more to us than than uh, just Muslims. You know, there are more bad things if 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 you like. I mean, if you, if you want it more bad things more good things about us there you know uh there when are when was that moment when you felt like you had that breakthrough moment in your career a breakthrough moment in my career when i first uh i had this uh, stand-up gig with uh, uh at, at one of the biggest uh, theater building in jakarta uh the capital the capital of indonesia i in front of, of more than 500 audience i'm like Whoa, these people are going to listen to me. Like, me are they think. going to really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. It, it, it's, it seems weird to just talk about comedy without playing a little clip of your comedy. So, this is a little clip from a report that was done by the Moral Courage Channel. Have a, have a look at Sakdia in action. Pantesan orang Islam pada teriak-teriak senangannya bahwa kebencian kemana-mana gitu ya. Kerjaannya makan tidur, gak baca buku, gak punya pengetahuan. Ada apa-apa langsung marah, ada video porno langsung tahu. So when it comes to telling jokes, like dear, what's your biggest challenge in Indonesia? Yeah. My my biggest challenge is really to select which which part of my experience that I would like to share oh. with my audience and which part that I would like to sort of reserve uh, mm. for next time. So uh, in 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 the way that I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm sort of uh, building you know building pathways really. You have to uh, you have to uh, start and open ways for yourself to be able to finally address issues that mean so much to you. You know, you have to start because because as a as a comedian, people have to see you as being funny first. Yeah. Uh, as as being uh, a, 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 you know, as to well crafted your act because it's a performance. There's no other way. And so, uh, but gradually, that way I can, uh, you know, sort of uh, create. Right, let's let's a cut to the chase here, Sadia. Sadia, you're being very yeah, careful yeah, with okay. the words you're, you're choosing. What can you not tell jokes about in Indonesia? Um, there's um, there's this term in Indonesia. We yeah. call it uh, Sara in Bahasa Indonesia. S A R A. Uh, S means uh, suku or ethnicity. A means uh, agama or religion. Uh, R means ra uh, ras or uh, race. And A means uh, antar antar golongan or um, or community group. So, so you so, basically so cannot most, joke most about material that you would all of all of those issues <laughs> as a comedian uh, it, and, and sex and and politics. Yeah, interesting. Let me show you a little picture here. This is of Ibtaj when she was a little girl. She's, the picture is here on my, my laptop here. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> looking absolutely adorable. Uh, I can tell it's still you with, right now here, uh, Ibtaj. When you were younger, your ambition was to do what, to be what? Um, for the longest time, I would say probably until I was 20 you know, years old, I, my plan was to go to medical school and be a neurosurgeon. Oh. Um, and, you know, I 
really found myself, you know, within my sport. Um, I, I saw that, you know, I had a talent and I saw, you know, um, an underrepresentation within the sport of fencing in the United States. I didn't see very many people who look like me. Um, I didn't see, you know, African American women. I didn't see Muslim women present. And I saw, you know, that I was talented and I wanted to take advantage of that. And now when people see you and you have fans, oh, what, what, what do they, what do they tell you? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, um, you know, a small victory, uh, you know, in my own head that, um, you're, you're not seen for your veil. You're not seen for the color of your skin, but rather yeah. for your abilities as an athlete. And I think that that was definitely, you know, a defining moment in my career where, you know, I, I was, you know, blessed to become one of the best in the world. Um, you know, just almost in a sense that like you've made it and all those, those long hours of um, practicing and, you know, what people don't see, you know, where, you know, when you don't want to wake up in the morning, but you have to get to the gym when you're ready to sleep, you know, but you yeah. still have more training left. I think that that's um, when, you know, you feel most f fulfill fulfilled, you know, when you're blessed to, you know, be able to be on the medal stand. Adina, I want to go to you because we got a tweet from someone named Kimagisa, and this person uh, tweets this. You can take a look at my screen here. They say, an all-women mosque, can that be granted in Islam? And that's because they knew you were coming on our show. And so when Femi asked that question about, you know, she asked uh, Ipti Hatch, what did you want to be? Did you see yourself doing this uh, in the future? Did you see yourself leading um, the Friday congregational prayer for an all-female mosque? Absolutely not. It, the, the Women's Mosque of America was not my dream. It's not something I thought I needed growing up, um, wow. or at least in more, my more recent life. Uh, it was the dream of Hasna Mazavi since she was a young girl to start a mosque. And as she got older, it became a vision of a women's mosque. And uh, I got looped in because I got asked to be the understudy to the first woman who was going to give the sermon. And that kind of made me take a really deep breath and think, oh my God, I'm so, like, there, you know, somebody else should do this was my first response. And then I thought about my mentor, Dr. Mahara Tood, who always said, rather than thinking, why me, think, why not me? And I thought yeah. to myself, I, you know, if I can do this, then other women can do this. And just like uh, Saktia said, um, paving that path for uh, charting that, that path and just building it yourself, um, I'm grateful to have had this opportunity. But um, I am part of a mosque that is, uh, is very well integrated. Um, my co-ed mosque and the women's mosque just supplements that. And I've been so proud to see the ways that having this kind of spiritual safe space that nurtures their Quranic literacy, their connection to God and their sisterhood, this place to be able to support each other. Mm -hmm. And to also, our next chapter is to gain, provide them with um, a Quran uh, study circle so that there can be more Quranic literacy mm -hmm. because to the question on you know the tweet that you got about um, where is the precedent for this in Islam, that's part of what I talked about in my sermon, that this is a continuation of our legacy as Muslim women, not a departure from it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the prophet granted a woman the right to, to uh, lead her household in prayer. Um, there are precedents that exist, but frankly, this is a, a, a space by and for women only during the Jummah prayer. Everything else about what we're offering is co-ed, um, and we uh, are really excited by the fact that our supporters, um, you know, outshine our detractors many fold. And I think that that speaks to the timing of this project getting off the ground now and the founding team of women and men um, and all the thought and hard work that they've put into it. Idina, you speak, you're often the, the first woman speaker who goes to many different mosques. When you're about to speak, how does that, and you know that no other woman has done that before, how do, how, how do you feel about that and what do you have butterflies are you like okay here we here we go again <laughs> another over, first I have to say, no over the years i the butterflies have gone away but yeah. anybody who knows me well knows that i still get nervous and i think that it's it's maybe it's a gendered thing since we're a panel of all women it's something mm -hmm. i'm curious to see how other people feel about but i also um being the first doesn't scare me anymore uh doing a a, a strong enough job setting a, a standard of to show that it can be done and done well so that it creates that opportunity for the second and the third and, and so forth is what's really, uh, really so important to me. But sure, there have been lots of times where I've been the first and I uh, always go back to the dua, that special prayer, uh, asking God to free the knot from my tongue and asking God to help me to connect authentically with the audience um, and to, you know, and to do this work with, with a cause because 
Um, I'm, I'm very well aware it's not about me, um, but I want to create opportunities for others because when I was growing up in my mosque in San Diego, um, I looked around and I uh, didn't see anybody who looked like me um, who I thought I could relate to, and the sermon was done completely in Arabic with no translation. There was no youth group, and this is the late 80s, early 90s. That mosque has now transformed itself and is one of, I think, one of the bright um, bright spots on the landscape of American mosques, um, but uh, I, you know, I know what it's like to feel um, uh, invisible, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. And well, I have seen and, now and Dina, through the you, women who come to the women's mosque it, that feeling too. Dina, do you feel that women are invisible sometimes in that mosque space deliberately? It depends on the mosque. I won't yeah. even uh, go into generalizations, but here's a couple of things I do know. Yeah. One is that more women than ever are serving on boards and even as board chairs at mosques around America. That's not as rare um, or as, you know, gasp worthy as it uh, as it was even a couple of years ago. And here in Southern California, there's a handful of mosques that are currently chaired by uh, by women. Um, uh, that's one thing we know. Things are changing, and that's the, I like to focus on the bright spots. Yeah. The other thing that we know is that mosques, uh, because of a study done by Hartford Seminary, um, we know that uh, m the number of mosques that have changed their policy to allow women to serve on boards, um, it used to be in 2000, 31% of mosques that didn't allow women to serve on boards. That number dropped to just 13% by 2011, wow. but the shocking thing is that only half of those mosques have actually been able to have a woman run for the board successfully. And so that's what I am particularly interested in, is how do we meet that gap? Because we need to empower women with the confidence and the skills to be able to take their rightful place at the table and to contribute, um, you know, uh, rather than, right. than uh, you know, sure. uh, other alternatives. So Adina, then the question online is, how do you do that empowerment? And so Ella, I'm going to direct this to you. This is from Hajar, and she says that one of the biggest challenges to this, this empowerment, is cultural. You can challenge laws, you can change laws, she says, you can pass new ones, but they can only be implemented if the society understands the importance to offering equal opportunities to both the gender. And she says it's tedious and it's long work. And Ala, of course, you're doing this, uh, this tedious work in, in a society that's also fraught with conflict as of right now. Libya, how do you go about doing that? Well, I think, I, first off, I agree with them um, in terms of the way that you want to redefine the way people look at you, but I don't think it's going beyond the veil. I think it's just simply redefining the title of Muslim women, because there are women from all different walks of life who just happen to be Muslim who are doing phenomenal things, and it's always used as a disadvantage. When it comes to um, the implementation of law, that's extremely difficult when you have cultural limitations, and those cultural limitations have historically been founded on religious manipulation. Um, and so that manifests very clearly within, within the Middle East, but it's across the spectrum of all religions. And I think when it comes to Islam, what's happened was for the past 1,400 and plus years, we've had very dominant male interpretation of our texts. We've had very dominant male leadership, and they have created policies which do reflect their, their world view. And what we need to do now is we need to introduce women's voices into that, because the fact that they've been absent for so long or, or undermined or excluded purposefully um, has led to, to a, a false assumption that the text itself is absent of women. And, and I think that's the danger. Yeah. So I do think we genuinely need to refocus our concerns on, rather than focusing only on political and economic empowerment of women, saying we need to change the very foundation, the reasons that they are limited in the first place. And we need to focus on redefining the cultural understanding of what women's roles are, the perception of their, their roles, and why it's important for them to be included, both from a modern worldview, but also from an Islamic worldview. Women have traditionally been included in Islam, and our culture does not reflect the role that they've had. Mm. Ella, what was it about the Libyan revolution that suddenly gave women their voices? What, what happened? Can you describe that for us? Well, I think in all conflict, there tends to be a very temporary kind of gender uh, shift or uh, shift of the, the gender roles. And the reason that happens is simply because you need all ha hands on deck, right? You're, you're the underdog in a conflict, and you need everybody to push through together. And that's definitely what happened here. But much like historical conflicts where women find uh, you know, empowerment in that brief time, they do tend to go back to their, their gender roles uh, prior to the conflict. And it takes some time for them to recognize that, no, they do have rights, and they are going to demand these rights.
And I think in our part of the world and in Libya, it's not only a, a part of them not recognizing or them not understanding. I, I think we don't give women enough credit. I think they genuinely recognize that they deserve to be treated as equals. And I think we have systemi is, is systemically made it impossible. Um, a system is built against them where she might know that it's, it's not her husband's right to hit her, but mm. she won't leave because she won't get to have her kids at the end, or she won't be able to sustain herself. Right. Um, so I think we need to recognize that we have to create systems which empower women. We can't simply be giving lip service. Yes, there needs to be cultural re-education for both men and women, but there also needs to be structural changes to the way we treat women within our own societies. Give me one example, because you, you, this is a broad sweeping statement and people are looking to you for help here. One example of that would be what? Aha, I called you on it, I right? Th <laughs> I think one example is reassessing the personal status laws throughout the Middle East. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's um, I definitely mm -hmm. think it's extremely important. I think it's important that when we're talking about... Go ahead. Sorry? Go ahead. I. Well, no, I'm saying we, we tend to have a lot of international NGOs and a lot of activists and a lot of international speakers talk about the oppression of Muslim women or, or and bring up specific examples of their treatment post-divorce or their accessibility to their children post-divorce and um, or, or violence against women and, and, and the rates that we have, most of which are extremely under-researched. And I think that what we can do is we can start demanding more of governments in our region, but also across the board of the Islamic community to have more women's leadership, to have more women speakers at conferences, to have more women sharing their experiences and to demand changes to the way that women are seen within our own community so that those changes can then be brought into right. institutions and policies. Well, Ibtihaj, you know, Femi asked for one example and you heard Alaa give her example and her experience. Um, here's an answer from someone on Twitter. This is Rueda and she says, another way to do this is by reclaiming the narrative. It's vital the that narrative. we challenge mainstream media and other stereotypes by building our presence and developing our identity. So Ibtihaj, when I first learned about you, it seems like you were doing exactly what this tweet says. You are, are, are taking your, your flag, really, which is your scarf, and you're using it in sport. And so now you are one of the most famous fencers in the U.S. here, especially for the Muslim community. But talk to us about reclaiming that narrative. And is that even something that you are cognizant of? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that Adina touched on really interesting points in um, that, you know, just kind of being comfortable with who you are. I know for a lot of us growing up, um, you know, as, as Muslim Americans, especially as women, we struggle, you know, if we're, um, you know, the only Muslim girl in our class or the only Muslim girl in our school, and you kind of, you know, question, you know, um, yourself and, you know, uh, your identity and who you are. And I think a lot of that... Um, we can rectify a, a lot of that thought process by, you know, uh, assessing, um, you know, that 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 notion within our community amongst our young women. And uh, for me, it it almost just comes to a point where I, 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 you know, work to achieve certain things within my athletic career. At this point, they're, you know, not for myself, but they're for, you know, all of us. I want, you know, people to hold Muslim women, to hold hijabi women, to hold hold minorities in, yeah. in high esteem and high, you know, regard and uh, to not place us and, you know, pigeonhole us in these boxes and say, this right. is what you're supposed to do. Uh -huh. I remember being a kid and mm -hmm. people telling me, you know, you're black, you shouldn't fence or Muslims don't fence. This isn't something that Muslim women, that Muslim women do. And um, that's something that I had to to grow from and not allow, I mean, I, at any point I could have stopped, you know, fencing and said, you know what, these people are right. This isn't something that I should do. And I, I was blessed to have parents that encouraged me to be involved in sport and, you know, to try to fight those stereotypes and not allow people to say, you know, this isn't something that you do. And a lot of women, a lot of kids don't have that in their lives. And that's why I think it's important for each of us to continue on our path and, you know, not allow people to dictate your journey for you, but to kind of, you know, take take hold of your own destiny and do do exactly what it is that you're good at, you know, and chase that to chase mm -hmm. that dream. Right. That's all the time we have in our main show. But we're taking all of the guests to the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. Malika, how's this conversation going down online? Uh, people are loving this. A lot of people are, I, their eyes have been opened with this, which mm -hmm. is kind of exciting to see. But there's more in the post show, naturally. All right. And you'll be able to talk to Sakdia Marouf, Adina Lekovic, Ibtihaj Mohammed, and Ala Murabit. Ladies, we have some online conversation to have in just a moment. See you there. Thanks for watching, everybody.
Hi, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about Muslim women who are breaking stereotypes and challenging the status quo. I, I want to share a story with you from Sadia. I'm going to get Sadia to tell the story, but it cracked me up when she told me. Um, and this was about when she was first getting known for her stand-up and the she, she got a write-up in the paper, but she hadn't really mentioned to her parents that she was doing stand-up. So, Sakdia, you pick up the story from there. What, what did you do? Yeah, um, what I do at that time was uh, trying to make sure that my parents uh, do not have, did not have access to that newspaper. So I ran around uh, the blocks. Uh, we don't have that term in Indonesia, but yeah, I, I ran around the blocks in my neighborhood buying all of the newspapers, uh, you know, containing my, my photos and just to make sure that no one sees, uh, I mean, I'm glad that my parents did not uh, read that much of newspaper. They still don't. So, but still, you have to make your effort. <laughs> you have to be <laughs> What was the point? So, yeah. You, yeah. What was the point when you were comfortable with what you were doing and you felt you could share it with your family members? When was that transition point? Uh, the uh, when I the the transitions uh, happen. Uh, okay, sorry, excuse me. Uh, the transition happened when I was uh, trusted to appear in a platform that I thought is good enough to share uh, with my parents yeah. and uh, with uh, the uh, entire family, basically. Interesting. Um... So for for them to to realize that doing comedy is worth it. Sure. They still don't, I mean, but yeah, long shot. Adina, you know, after you spoke on the show, of course, just a few minutes ago in the main show, we got so many tweets and a lot of them look like this. I'm going to read this one to you and get your thoughts. This is Yemi Bello, that's the handle, and he says, no, this is un-Islamic. There is nothing like a woman's only mosque. That would be an innovation, and it's not allowed in Islam. But just so you know that this view isn't the only one, we also got tweets like this from mm -hmm. Sizwina, who says, this provides a good platform for female scholars with discourse that's not patriarchal. You can see that on my screen here. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can explain that for our audience. On the one hand, those who say what you are doing is beyond the fold, and those who say, actually, this is complementary. Yeah. Okay. How much time do we have? I'll ju jump right in. Um, I, this is one of the most common questions that we get. And we need to start from a place of understanding that women were treated as equals and scholars uh, in the early days of Islam by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and including this woman named Om Waraka, who was uh, given permission to lead her household in prayer. It sets a precedent. Um, we know within Islamic tradition that precedent is a, is a big deal um, and that it sets a foundation. We also then can trace through Islamic history um, many examples of women-only mosques um, that were intended to complement co-ed spaces, not compete with them or uh, you know, isolate women uh, to any degree. Um, in fact, one of the longest running traditions of women-only mosques is in China. Um, and women's only mosques have existed in at least a dozen countries around the world, including many Muslim majority countries like Indonesia, like Indonesia, Lebanon, absolutely. like Syria. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, this is not an American phenomena, quote unquote. And I think that's one of the funny things that comes up over and over again. Like, oh, here go these American Muslims again, changing Islam. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, this is, a, you know, this is a case in point of why we need to go back to that religious literacy and religious education. Is women are being um, tricked into believing that this is not their right and it's not a platform, um, and that, uh, and and it's distorting what we what we know from Islam. And as somebody already mentioned, this is points to the need for more women scholars to speak in our own voices, first and foremost. Um, on the second point about whether this is segregation um, uh, or you know, complementary or competitive, um, the whole point of the women's mosque, even having a monthly Jummah prayer, is so that um, we offer a sort of extracurricular experience, right? You have women's only colleges, you have women's only gyms. These are not places to exclude yourself from uh, co-ed life entirely. Instead, they provide a sanctuary of sorts, and a house of worship is supposed to be a sanctuary. Um, since we launched um, this question of sort of what's allowed and you know and and how you know what, what kind of rules do we have inside the mosque has been one that we've given a great deal of 
attention to. And we've even ex expanded our services during the Jomah prayer, um, which again is intended to be complimentary, not competitive. But uh, so that we, w one time we had a woman, um, Iman Hasabullah Ali from Chicago, give a bayan, a talk before the khutbah, because she herself did not um, subscribe to the belief that she uh, could lead a, lead other women in the Turaka Jama prayer. Idina, so we create. Do you know what yes. this sounds like? It sounds like you've got your defense ready for anybody who criticizes well, you. Well, it's, you know what? The thing is that this is. It sounds like I know that people are going to say this, and I am ready for them. Absolutely, because there's precedent here. Like this is, I think, again, I, if you, if we could just open people's eyes and hearts to the truth of what Islam is, they would realize that this is again not a departure. Yeah. You know, this is a continuation, and it's not threatening. Yeah. It's meant to again complement uh, and and help women to serve their their co-ed mosques right. and broader society. And I don't see why anybody could be against that. All right, uh, but yet they are. Uh, Allah, what did of you course. want? To, what did you want to add but, on this point? Well, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, Dina keeps pointing out how it's not complimentary, how we're not trying to compete, how it's, and I think it's absolutely wonderful because I think it's actually going to force other mosques, the co-ed mosques, the mosques that are gone to by the vast majority of the population to, to bring in women's voices. I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful rather than saying, happening. okay, well, we're going to be quiet about the fact that we've been excluded for so long. I think it's going to make other mosques Exactly, and I think it's great. So I don't, I mean, anybody who says that just simply say this is going to transform our society as a whole because we need to hear more women's voices, and it's unusual for people to have them in the religious space, which is so disappointing. But the fact that you're bringing them in, I think, is a great, a great idea for future generations. I'd, I, I think if yeah. I may add, if uh, I may add to to uh, to the discussion. Um, I think uh, what is what is really important is to recognize the diversity in which Muslim, uh, Muslims are practicing Islam in many different countries. In, in Indonesia, for instance, we're the largest Muslim country in the world. We have Muslims populations. Uh, the number of our Muslims populations is perhaps uh, bigger, uh, slightly bigger than the number of entire Muslims in the Middle East combined. However, what is happening in the middle uh, in in the Middle East, or what you know how uh, how Islam is practiced in a certain place, defined how uh, defined and 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 set the bar of oh okay so this is Islam define Islam how it is practiced how Muslims uh, uh, is how Muslims are practicing Islam in certain place define how you know. Oh, okay. So this is uh, this must be how Muslims uh, are so practicing Islam I know you, I, I, around I, I, the world. I, I don't know. I'll put words in your mouth, but I know you have an example of this about how in Indonesia you actually have your uh, own languages, your own customs, and yet uh, the trend right now is to be more Arabic. Do you want, do yeah, you want to just absolutely. finish that? Yeah, 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 me, yeah. That thought. Yeah. Oh, all that is left is for them to do a nose job. Uh, just to look like to look more like Middle Easterners, but maybe some of them would think that that is too Kardashians. I don't know. So yeah, that 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 is really uh, what is happening right now, and it's it's such a pity uh, for me. We have a very very strong uh, tradition um, developed by sort of traditionalist uh, traditionalist Muslims who's like um, you know. Putting uh, Islam's more more down to earth, more suitable to uh, to the practices uh, and and to the culture of of Indonesia, merging uh, that experience with the experience of of becoming uh, Indonesian. But we're growing uh, more and more, feeling like the strangers in our own skin, as if we're not Muslims enough if we don't look like Middle Easterners. Yeah. Can I uh, chime in really quickly? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that, that we also have yeah. that discourse um, within the United States, within the African American community. Yeah. Um, like, how often are African American Muslim asked, you know, like, well, when did you convert, you know, um, and, or, you mm -hmm. know, or you're even asked, like, whether or not you're Arab, um, simply because, you know, you do wear, you know, you do wear hijab. Um, that a lot of people don't know that the first Muslims in the United States were African Americans. So um, mm -hmm. I think that we have a really similar conversation going on in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
And some of that education yeah. is happening um, in the elementary and high school levels in, in, in schools, at least here in the U.S. And so that's why I want to play this video comment. This is from someone you might know her name because she was featured in a couple of articles not too long ago for being voted best dressed among her peers. She goes to a school uh, here in the United States in the state of New Jersey. And this is what she had to say on this topic. This is Abrar. I don't believe that the way a Muslim woman dresses should dictate how the world should perceive her. These misconceptions are nothing but ideas that hold little truth. Hijab is the reason I'm here speaking today. Hijab has given me the platform to voice my concerns and break these notions of oppression. I'm proud to be a Muslim American woman that has found a way to prove that hijab is not limiting my ability to succeed in any way. Of course, the hijab discussion or the scarf discussion is a whole other show and one that the stream actually has done. But I saw you all nodding your heads when she was uh, making her comment. Ibtihaj, what were you thinking? Um, no, she's right. I, 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 I hate the, the idea that, you know, hijab hinders you in any way. If anything, I feel like yeah. it makes me more confident and, you know, feel mm -hmm. like I can take on the world. And, you know, as an athlete, like, Absolutely. I feel like it almost wow. gives me, like, you know, the ability yeah. to to perform better, you know? Um, so if anything, I feel like it's definitely a, a, a great platform for us. Yeah. I love Very it. quick, there's no better time to be Muslims other than today. I, I just wanna um, kind of, mm. go ahead, Allah. Well, I, I, I just wanna cut in with that for, a, for one second on a more global um, look at the hijab though. I personally choose to wear hijab, and I think it's very, very empowering, and I, and I appreciate that a lot of women feel that way. But I think the com some of the comments throughout the Muslim community itself is in countries where hijab is imposed on women. So I recognize mm -hmm. both aspects mm -hmm. of that conversation. I think there's a beauty in choice, and it's wonderful that we have four women who have chosen to wear it on this panel. But I think we do have to recognize that in a large part of the world, because of, or a large part of the Islamic world, because of a lack yeah. of education and awareness and, and a complete uh, a negation of women's role within faith and rights within faith, they have been minimized in certain ways. And, and dress is one of the ways in which other parts of society take advantage of them. So I think we have to be very cognizant of that. And I think when we're talking about um, kind of the Arabization of, of Islam or, or kind of mm -hmm. looking at the most extreme factions, extremism feeds off of one another. That's, that's global. I mean, that's not just to do with Islam. The more Islamic extremist groups you have, then the more you know, right-wing conservative extremist group you have. It, it's, it feeds off one another. And I think, I think because of the way that uh, the Arab community or the Arab world, um, part particularly politically, has dominated Islam on a global scale, it is translating across borders. And I think it's a shame because I think a lot of, a lot of the aspects of, of Arab political leaders' definitions of Islam do not translate as actual Islam and are not translating well across borders and are changing the way that it works within those countries and are making women feel insignificant and as though they're not equal citizens in Indonesia or in the United States. And, and I do think it comes down a lot to the political and economic institution of Islam. All right, so guests, we are out of time for this show, but I am gonna ask you to do one thing for me. There will be people who are watching this show are inspired by you. So I would like you to leave our audience with a sentence each. If they want to be you when they grow up, what's the best piece of advice you can give? Actually to a, a young Muslim woman or actually to a young Muslim man. I, I think it's a, I think we shouldn't be gender specific here. So Allah, your advice would be what in a sentence? My advice would be to read as much as possible about all different um, religions and subjects and, and understand the role of women historically and understand the role of women within Islam and then work within your own community, be it your mosque, your synagogue, your church, um, to really empower women within that faith community and to highlight their voices and to amplify their voices. Um, and I'm gonna add a little second tidbit here on um, lobbying your governments uh, to ensure that women are included in peace processes and security processes and political processes, which is something that we unfortunately do not do enough. All right, little girls, take notes, start lobbying your government. All right, uh, have a look here on, on, the, on, the, on the laptop here. When I was this age, Ibti, my dad used to make me watch the news and it drove me crazy. I think it was probably why I ended up doing this job now. So if you were looking at a little girl like this, a little girl like this is watching Al Jazeera because her dad won't let her change the channel, what, what advice would you give her if they wanted to grow up and be like you? Well, really quickly, I want to point out that Malika, I see your top. Um, you are awesome for that. And uh, she mentions that because <laughs> this top is from her line. So not only is she a world-class fencer, but she's also a fashion designer. 
Ah, uh, you're so sweet. I appreciate oh, that. Oh, wow, um, really? Well, I mean, on it, I mean, just really quickly, I started my clothing company because I saw a void uh, within the United States for modest clothing that was fashionable and affordable. Um, if anyone is interested, you can order it. It's available online. Itty, um, you're shameless. Yeah. We're wasting time. You've got a young Muslim woman here, a <laughs> young little girl. You've got to inspire. Really I, I, Go ahead. I, I, I had to give Malika a shout out. I think that she, I, I love yeah. you. You're awesome. She has a Anything. phone, Itty. We do <laughs> not have to do this online. It. I appreciate it. All right. It. Oh, you're awesome. Uh, you're, you're anyway, one sentence. I, honestly, I've, I've tried to, you know, live my life with, um, uh, I don't know, just, you know, to not, you know, pigeonhole yourself and to set really high goals for yourself and not, you know, and always believe that you can achieve them um, regardless of your race, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your religion. So um, I would say if you have a dream, don't be afraid to go out there and work hard for it. Adina, we're almost out of time. We're going to be off on the internet in less than a minute. Go ahead. What's your, what's your line of inspiration for us? Uh, what comes to mind is an Alice Walker quote, the uh, author of Color Purple. And uh, she said, the greatest, the most common way that people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Mm. And that has stuck with me every single day since I've read it, because I think that's where my advice is, which is that we, instead of waiting for permission, as, uh, my, as uh, Hasna, the founder of uh, the Women's Moth likes to say, we're taking our own permission. And I think that little girls need to just claim their voice and, uh, you know, own their platform of whether it's wearing hijab or not wearing hijab, but they're just their Muslim identity. And that ultimately it's about us telling our story. Uh -huh. So going out and making friends with people of other faiths or no faith at all is one of the best things you can do for Islam today because less than one in four people in America know a Muslim. And yet we also know that the single greatest predictor of whether somebody has a positive or negative perception of us yeah. as Muslims is whether they know a Muslim. Okay. So we are the answer to our own problem or to our own challenges. And so own your story, share it, be comfortable talking about yourself and your faith with others and keep Adina trying, you'll get better. the world's longest sentence. I love it. Thank you so much, Adina. <laughs> <laughs> Sadia, what would you say to that little girl in Indonesia who, who's really funny and wants to tell jokes? Have fun. Mm. Muslims are rarely recognized as fun, and it's not haram to have fun, but uh -huh. remember to get your MD or PhD. You can <laughs> shut the mouth of the society, you know? Sp <laughs> have that degree, and then you could, you're good to go. Spoken like your a heart. true auntie like that. Uh, Malika. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave us with this comment from Maryam, who says, for too long, people have, uh, people have talked about and for Muslim women, but times have changed. Muslim women are fed up, and they're speaking up. Sakdia Maruf, Edina Lekovic, Ibtihaj Mohammed, and Ala Murabit. Thank you for making this a very enlightening conversation. We really appreciate you being here.